Good morning, my dear brethren. It is with great joy that we have anticipated this time together to see your faces, uh, to hear your voices in song, uh, to pray together, to sit at meal together, all of the things that we do here as we fellowship with our God in Christ Jesus, our Savior, and drink and eat deeply of the table that has been set for us, the table of the Lord, of his truth, is the revelation of his will and purpose, to have a people for his name, and to be justified in all of his words and in all of his works that he has done, both seen and unseen, things that are now made known, things that were not made known in the past, but things that are now made known. And so those are the things to which we give our attention, we focus our thoughts, our words, turn our eyes and our ears to those things, the things that are made known, things that could not be uncovered or discovered by human intellect, by uh, laboratory experiments, by searching in the earth, by probing the minds and hearts of men, because these things were not there. They, were thi they are things above. They are things above that have been made known to us. And we are glad. We are glad to give our hearts and minds to them. We are not content. We are not content to speak about ourselves, not content to speak about the things that are done in the earth and human religious institutions and philosophies and, and uh, ideas uh, that have been bandied about and that are promoted in the earth. We want to hear a word from God. We want to hear the voice of the Lord. We want to hear what he has done, how he has made himself known, and the works, the great works that he has done in the earth, the record, the record that he has left us of his working, of his hand, of his mind made known to the hearts of men, those who are willing to know, that is. Some are not willing to know. Some have no love of the truth. Some want to be able to compose their own truth, so to speak. If that were possible, we know it's not. <laughs> Even when men observe a truth, they're not able to rightly interpret it, are they? How many times have we seen this? Even on a human level, even on an earthly level, not able to rightly interpret it. When the storm struck Joplin that evening, I heard of two people who, in a panic, ran, trying to escape to their car. They wrongly interpreted a message that was given to them, and they were taken up into the storm. It literally removed them from the earth. Wrong interpretation, see? It, it was right there on them, and they had a way of escape, but they did not listen to the one who warned them. He said, come in quickly, come in quickly. And so they were taken by the wind. Well, brethren, the Most High has delivered a warning message to the human race. Personally delivered it, hasn't he? Personally delivered. He walked among us. He took on flesh and walked among us, and we have beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So these are the things that we have come to give our attention to during these three days. We will begin our series of meetings these three days with the text from Isaiah 53, and verse 5. We will end the meetings with that text as well, or that section of text. Brother Jason will preach from a, an expanded uh, version of this text, verses, I think, 3 through 6, 4 through 6. I'm preaching just from verse 5. Brother Gibbon uh, will preach from the end of that section that we call Isaiah 53. It's staggering when you think of how many times statements from this section of the prophet are quoted in the writings of uh, the Gospels. Every Gospel, of course, quotes from some section of Isaiah 53 in one form or another, maybe just a phrase, three or four words. Of course, the Apostle Paul quotes it again and again. Peter 
cites this particular text, what we call verse 5, in his first letter. As its main and his main fulfillment, of course, being in his master, the one with whom he walked. It was only James and Jude, of all of the New Covenant scriptures, Gospels, Acts, and letters. James and Jude are the only ones who do not refer to it either this, this chapter, this section, either directly or indirectly. It's only James and Jude. That's, a, that's an amazing thing when you think about it. And, and it shows the, uh, uh, the value that the Holy Spirit placed on this section of the revelation given to the prophet Isaiah. For it to be cited again and again and again and again in these writings. So it's certainly appropriate considering our primary topic, what Jesus accomplished in our behalf, that we should give great attention to this section of the record of the prophet Isaiah. Also note as we, uh, in, in the messages that, that are from this text, and especially in, the, in this section here, the prophet speaks of the things that are done with present and past tense verbs not future tense verbs. It's a done deal. God has spoken and it will be done. Doesn't matter the span of time that must be fulfilled until the appointed time, until time is full, that, that doesn't matter in some sense. In another sense, God is filling up the time, not just with random things, of course, but things that will bring these words to their fulfillment see things that are connected aspects of the truth that are needed that are necessary that will support the proposition if you may if you will the proposition of truth that's been established and revealed and made known in Christ Jesus so these words report or repeat the same truth from from various aspects various angles of view, if you want to see it that way, affirming to us that however you look at it, from wherever you stand, God has done a great work, a good work, a complete work. He has done what needed to be done for his name's sake, for the sake of the truth, to establish justice and righteousness and to grant us peace with him. And a hope, an everlasting hope. Now, you all know that this is not an ordinary human hope. It's not just some wishful thinking that maybe if all things work right with the weather and with the calendar and so forth. We just came from uh, Ohio last evening where our, we married our youngest son to a sweetheart. And just two days before, a wedding was rained out. Some young lady was very, very disappointed. She very much wanted to have her wedding in that park. And so... Uh, Caleb and Rachel had planned for months and months to have that, and, and the weather worked fine and so forth, and that's the way you have to plan human things, you know. The weather works fine if nobody has car trouble and, and, and nobody gets sick and on and on and on like that, but not so the Most High. Amen. Not so. You see, he makes appointments and he keeps them, and it just doesn't matter what men may think. doesn't matter what men may choose. See, this is the fallacy of emphasizing in your teaching what men should do, right. what men could do, what men might do. The focus is what the Most High will do. Mm -hmm. To see that, to understand that, to join yourself to his will and purpose. And so for our present consideration then, the things that have been made known to us Involve not just events, not just a calendar, but a person. We're people, you see. That's what we needed, a person. Not just a, not just a religious ritual. We needed a person because we're people. And God needed a person because he's a living being. And these are real things that involve life, not inanimate life, not life that's in trees and plants and animals, 
but life that is in people, made in his image, male and female, in his own name. The Most High, we know the Most High needed someone. Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? We couldn't receive him. He knew he couldn't come to us. It's a terrifying thing. Israel said, you go, Moses. You speak to him. We can't hear his voice. We'll die. And that was just from the mountain. And they were down at the base. Now, someone had to go in, in a manner that we could approach, that we could. That we, that we could come, that we could receive in ourselves. And he knew that, and he was able, of course, to provide that. There are some who think God uh, could not do such a thing. Why, it was blasphemy for the master to speak the way that he did about his father, because God would not do what Jesus of Nazareth was, con was, was claiming that he would do, would he? That's what his enemies thought. That's what many still say today. There are, there are those who say that we are blaspheming when we speak of God having a son as he has been revealed. That we're blaspheming when we say that. Because God, the God of heaven, would not do such a... He has done it. He has revealed that he was going to do it. He has said and he's accomplished and fulfilled these things right down to the last jot or tittle. He has kept his word faithful. So it involves a person, not just events, a person of great worth and righteousness in the sight of heaven. You see, this person not needed to be received not primarily on earth, but primarily needed to be received in heavenly places because that's where we're going. All will stand before the judgment seat of God and give account. That's where we're going. Like it or not, that's what I tell the young people at the Juvie Center, the county juvie, every Wednesday afternoon. Almost every Wednesday afternoon, I say that in some form. have an hour Bible lesson with them on Wednesday afternoons, Debbie and I do. We tell them, we're going to God, ready or not. You're going to God. You're going to stand before the Maker. Prepare to meet your God. Now, I've looked into their eyes and said that to them. 13 to 16-year-old boys and girls. Prepare to meet your God. Now those of us who have gathered here, most all of us, are doing that very thing. We're preparing. We know that is a, that is a, a, a staggering, a striking thing to stand in the presence of God. Were we not prepared, we would not be able to remain. We would enter in, but we would not remain. We'd not want to remain. But from what's been made known to us, we want to abide there. Amen. We are longing for the things that have been made known, hungering and thirsting for the wedding supper of the Lamb, willing to receive the invitation of the Spirit and the Bride to come, to come and eat and drink. So this one of great worth and great righteousness, highest esteem, by the inhabitants of the presence of God. He is the one. Sent from the presence of God. Who had glory with the Father before the world began. <coughs> Pardon me. Sent to earth. Humbling himself as a servant. And then, as he said, laying down his life according to his father's commandment and taking it up again. From an earthly point of view, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, 
and by his stripes we are healed. Now the next few sentences we know are the text that the eunuch was reading in his chariot as he traveled down the road. When the spirit said to Philip, go near, join yourself, or overtake this chariot. And so he was granted power to run with the horse, maybe several horses, likely several horses, considering the position of this man, and ask him, do you understand what you're reading? How can I unless someone leads me? And he invited him to come up and sit in the chariot. And they read that text, another section of this text. And Philip began at that place and preached unto him Jesus, the Savior, the Master. His wounds, a bruising and a chastisement and stripes due to others, not to him, yet he took it upon himself. The Father and the Son in the halls of eternity set this plan in motion before the world began. From the foundation of the world, all of God's works are known to him. They executed this purpose in the earth which no man knew. It was revealed and those to whom it revealed searched to know the time and the person, the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he spoke of these things. And it was revealed to them it was not for them to know. The Apostle Paul said that these things were mysteries kept hidden from the past, not revealed as they have now been revealed. Amen. As they've now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. This is why Philip was able to begin from this text then and preach Jesus to the eunuch and tell him these things about which we speak, some of these things. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. He was bruised. Now those of you who are familiar with the scripture, the first uh, cross text, if you will, of course, that comes to mind is Genesis 3.15. He shall bruise him on the heel. He shall bruise him on the head. Bruising. We're in a battle here. This is violent. Violent men. Now, now the, uh, some religious folk don't like to speak about things like this. You know, we're to have a message of, of kindness and goodness and unity so that everyone will feel accepted, comfortable, and at peace. That's, all what we, that, that's what we all want, isn't it? Well, that's not what God wants in that sense. Not at all. The Most High is a warrior. He has enemies. Those who reject his will and his purpose. And, of course, that is not done with impunity. Not at all. You do not set yourself against the Almighty and escape accountability. Amen. So sometime before the world began, this conflict began. And we're not told details. We're simply given a shadowy outline of it. Shadowy outline of the personality involved who exalted himself against the Most High. Now we know, we know more about the Most High than we do about this personality, don't we? which is as it should be. Since we stand in the purpose and the will of the Most High, and all things work together for the good of those 
He causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Now, the enemy of God has a purpose as well, of course. But his purpose shall not stand, we know. It shall not remain. It shall be broken down again and again and again and again. But, of course, since this enemy of God doesn't understand, since he is blinded, since he is calloused, since he has a nature that violates the truth and righteousness and goodness, he just keeps banging himself against this wall again and again and again, in some sense, bruising himself. Huh. But in all of this, there are those who are made in God's image, weak creatures weak beings in the earth that God has made, that God made good, but his enemy entered in and did things to violate the Most High, using those made in God's image to violate him and to bring God's wrath upon them. This, this great and high enemy of God knew what he was doing, he knew what God's reaction would be if he could bring those creatures, those beings, if he could bring them into a place where they would violate the Most High, he could just stand back and watch and also watch God be frustrated, he thought. He thought that God's purpose and will would be frustrated in this good place that he had made and that he could cause it to so to speak, collapse upon itself and just point and say, see, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's not so wise. He's not so powerful. But this enemy of God did not know, did he? He could have known, but he did not know because he rejected the knowledge of the truth. And so was sent upon him a spirit of delusion, so to speak. <laughs> and he has continued to be frustrated at every turn. Perhaps he thought that God would destroy the man and woman immediately when they ate the fruit. But he did not. In fact, God's, God immediately turned his attention to him and made this promise about a bruising. A bruising. One promise to come into the earth, the seed of woman, which turns our attention, of course, to Galatians chapter 4. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. This one, God's enemy would bruise on the, on the extremity, on his extremity, his heel which would cause a minor crippling for a time. But only for a time. For he would recover, you see. While this one born of woman would bruise God's enemy in the head. We'll all take the foot bruising over the head bruising, won't we? So this was God's promise then. And now here, millennia later, centuries later, this prophet spoke of one that he likely did not know, didn't see the extent of these words, though he searched and wanted to know, Peter says. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded. He was bruised for our iniquity. Those familiar with the scripture would immediately recall the promise in the garden to the enemy of God. Bruised. Bruised. But this one, this one was bruised.
Now, the revelation of the law tells us of many different kinds of bruisings, if you will, all the sacrificial system, the shedding of much blood, the price given for a soul that is costly, more than we can pay. Although those to whom those things were revealed seemed to think that they were paying the price with their bulls and their lambs and their birds and their grain and their drink. They seemed to think that they were paying the price. And that this was really all that God wanted was something of the works of their hands, something of, of some significant value from them, and then he would be satisfied. But you see, those who thought that didn't understand, did they? Some knew. And so we have their words. That's why we know that the cost for a soul is very high, and we cannot pay it. The one who has the soul cannot pay the price. What can we give for the sin of our soul? Your firstborn, rivers of oil. Heaven revealed it was going to take a bruising. It would take a bruising to pay the price. And there was one who was prepared. There was one who was prepared to come into the earth with a body prepared for him. He himself was prepared. The vessel that he would inhabit was prepared. All the time was prepared. The people was prepared. The place was prepared. The manner was prepared. All of this was made ready for the fullness of time. The hour of darkness, the master said. It was the hour of darkness when no man would know when the sun would be veiled at midday so no man would see the bruising of the one sent from heaven. Things that could not be seen by the eye of man. He entered into, he offered himself, Father, now the hour has come. Glorify your Son that he may glorify you. The one who prepared himself, who offered himself to be bruised, who did not turn away his back from scourging. While at the same time he prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. While at the same time he said, this day you shall be with me in paradise. And finally then he said, after the three hours of darkness, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. The bruising was finished. The price Praise was God. paid. Amen. Amen. The soul of great worth was offered to God and received Amen. as full and acceptable payment for all of humanity, not just that generation. From Adam, how heaven must have shaken as did the earth. How heaven must have been affected at these things that the Father and the Son worked in the earth that only they could do. No man, no man could contribute to this work. There was nothing in us, nothing of value that could be offered to pay this price. Amen. He is the only one with this worth, the only one esteemed of God his life, his blood. He was the price. His was the bruising for our iniquity. Our iniquity. The psalmist said, many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls have encircled me. My heart is like wax it has melted within me my strength is dried up like a pot shirt my tongue clings to my jaws you have brought me to the dust of death yes. 
our iniquity. Job's friend said, men drink iniquity like water. The priests in Hosea's day, the priests, the leaders, the ones to whom the law was entrusted, eat up the sin of my people. They set their heart on their iniquity. Now, those are just two statements. There are many, many other statements about iniquity in the scriptures. The prophet Isaiah in another place says, Then it was revealed in my hearing by the Lord of hosts, Surely for this iniquity there will be no atonement for you, even to your death. Now without the intercession of this one sent from heaven, that would be the sentence of all of us, wouldn't it? Unless we had had this intercessor. But God was not willing. He was not willing. His name would not be honored in the highest sense by the sweeping away of those who had rejected him. Even that would give, though God would be justified in some sense, that would give his enemy cause for accusation. And so heaven set out on a wiser course, full of mercy and goodness and truth, without compromise. There's no compromise here at all. This is why this is so precious, you see. This is why these things are so large and so high, because there's no compromise of God's righteousness, truth, wisdom, and peace. None whatsoever. In fact, by this bruising, these things were fully established in a way they had not been established and seen before. They were revealed. These things were revealed in a way they'd not been revealed before. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. Now that's from our perspective. There is a perspective from heaven, of course. The heavenly hosts were watching this bruising. Remember what the master said there in the garden? Don't you know that I can call on my father and he would send more than 12 legions of angels? But then how would the scripture be fulfilled? So the master gave himself to this bruising. This one whom they loved and whom they had said, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of life. He offered himself for this bruising while they all left him for a time. He was prepared for that. He knew. But the father didn't do it through that time. Except for the time that it was necessary. For brethren, we know that this is the prophet. Isaiah is the prophet who also says in the next few sentences, isn't he? That the Lord was pleased to crush him. This was God's will and it was the Son's will. This was the Father's will and the Son's will. This crushing, this bruising that he received for iniquities not his own. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He who knew no sin became sin bearing our sin in his body on the tree, that body that was prepared. He received the bruising that was due to us, as so many of our hymns say. It was due to us, wasn't it? But, of course, we could not recover. We would not have recovered. We've, we've all experienced the fear 
of that. When we came to conviction, haven't we? The fear of not, what do I do? What shall we do? There's no hope. Yes, there is. There's good news. There was one who received our bruising, those who believe. Well, he did receive the bruising for all, didn't he? It's those who believe who enter into the benefit, who receive what was accomplished, who partake of it, who join themselves to it and will not depart. Because in this truth that was revealed, you see, along with the good things are the wrath of God as well. And the more we see of his goodness, the more we also see of his wrath, don't we? We do not want that. We know that God's not pleased by that, although he will extend it. And he has again and again down through the generations, hasn't he? The whole earth was taken away except for those who were warned and prepared in an ark. Egypt was destroyed. The seven nations in Canaan wiped away. For all intents and purposes, some of them left. The Assyrians, gone. The Babylonians, gone. The Medes and the Persians, gone. The Romans, gone. Their powers, speaking of their powers, of course, there may be a small remnant here and there of just as a testimony, just as a reminder, you see, that they're not what they once were. God raised them up for his purpose and then took them away in his wrath. But with wrath, there is mercy, you see. There is mercy, and God has a remnant that he has kept for himself. He has done this. We have no claim. Those of us who believe, we have no claim, no place to stand in pride and say, oh, I have done not so. On the last great day, when the clouds part and he appears, if we should be on the earth, we shall say, this is our God for whom we have waited. Salvation is of the Lord. For he took our bruising. He was bruised for our iniquity now brethren i could have spent some time speaking more about our iniquities but do we need to do that i i i won't we all know them don't we yeah in the light of his glory we see light don't we 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 don't want to give too much attention to it once in a while we may need to recount some uh some shadow of an episode or something like that but let us beware let us beware the spotlight must be on the one who was bruised and who returned from the bruising who recovered from the bruising according to god's will god's purpose god's power god's wisdom god's grace god's truth he stood again that we might stand. He made a place for us in his presence that we might be with him forevermore and go out no more because he was bruised for our iniquities. God's grace and peace to you, brethren.